Once again, welcome to the Florida Maritime Museum. We're glad you made it out here. We are free admission. We are open Tuesday through Saturday, 9 to 4, and our website is floridamaritimemuseum.org. If you don't uh, do a lot with Facebook, is it louder now? Yes. Okay. It helps when you turn them on. Um, so Florida Maritime Museum is our website, and that's we try to keep it updated with upcoming events, upcoming new exhibits, all that kind of stuff. If you're on Facebook, we're also on Facebook, and we keep pretty active on there as well with updating when we've got new things coming up. And those are both good ways to stay in touch. If you don't want to do either one of those before you leave, if you sign our guest book and leave your email address, we have an e-newsletter we send out about once a month. We don't send out really hardly ever more than once a month, and we don't give the email address to anybody. Um, so you're not going to get a whole bunch of emails or anything like that. And that's the best way to keep up with everything we've got coming up in the next month or so. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is sort of fresh seafood, Florida seafood. So the first question of course is why Florida seafood? Um, seafood comes from all over the place and other than the obvious answer that you're in Florida and the beach is not more than about five miles that way. Uh, the other reason is that in 2014, over 92 million pounds of seafood came out of Florida. Um, now that doesn't mean that it was all caught necessarily in Florida waters, but that means that that much seafood was landed into Florida. And that works out to about $258 million worth of seafood. Um, now that's the final value on it. That's not what the fishermen are making or necessarily even what the fish houses are making, but that's when you get all the way through the chain, what the value adds up to on it. Um, with that Florida fishermen or fishermen that are landing their catch in Florida, it's a tricky thing. You don't have to be a Florida resident to be a commercial fisherman that lands fish in Florida. It does take a special state permit um, but you can be from anywhere. Potentially, if you have a federal permission for it, you can even be a non-U.S. citizen and land seafood in Florida as long as you have all the right permits. Um, but that Florida fishermen land more than 84% of the nation's grouper, pompano, mullet, stone crab, pink shrimp, spiny lobsters, and Spanish mackerel. Of those, the two that are really worth pointing out is that Florida lands, I think, 97% of the nation's American caught stone crab or American landed stone crab and a hundred percent of American landed spiny lobster um, So that's huge numbers when you look at that on a national level. So that's kind of the start of it There's a huge amount of seafood being landed in Florida So if you want to look for seafood, it kind of makes sense to look for stuff that got fortunately because of where we are got brought in on a boat literally just down the street the other thing to keep in mind is depending on where you are in Florida, sometimes there are regional specialties. There are some things that are kind of a big deal locally. Of course, here in Cortez, we have mullet. In Apalachicola, you have oysters. In Cedar Key, you have clams. In Key West, you have conch and spiny lobster, depending on the season. Um, way up in the northeast of Florida, you have shrimp, although shrimp are landed in a lot of places. That's where the big shrimp fleet still comes in and out of from Florida although other states now are starting to build pretty significant shrimp fleets as well. In some cases, those are boats that were built here or even Florida fishermen that are now landing their shrimp somewhere else because of better values or whatever the case may be. And then in the Gulf, we have grouper and snapper. Um, in the Atlantic, you get more mackerel and swordfish, although you can get grouper and snapper in both places and mahi-mahi in both places. One of the other things that also comes up all the time when you are looking at wild-caught seafood is sustainability. And so these are, throughout this entire talk, when I say something is sustainable, um, the people that I'm referencing that say it's sustainable are the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission or the Gulf and South Atlantic Fisheries, I think, Committee. I can never remember the last one. I know it starts with a C. Um, and then also uh, some of the other fisheries management companies. There are outside organizations there are conservation organizations that make their own lists of what they feel is sustainable and is not sustainable so in the case context of what i'm talking about today when i say sustainable what i mean is that according to the government entities that manage the fisheries that manage the fish populations the amount of fish in those species that is being caught is a low enough number that the remaining population can produce that much, basically the amount that was caught or more per year, so the overall population remains the same or increases. 
And so we've got a variety of different things here. Um, these are some of the Florida fin fish, so as opposed to shellfish. And most of these are sort of nearshore to offshore fish. There's not much that's really inshore that's commercially caught, aside from catfish in some places, uh, it, once you get sort of into rivers and lakes and that kind of thing. There are bait shrimp that are caught inshore, but bait shrimp aren't sold as food shrimp. Bait shrimp and food shrimp are the same species. Um, bait shrimp are generally the juveniles that when they grow up will go offshore and become food shrimp. But because they're caught as bait and not as food, the handling processes are different. And then we have, of course, the different shellfish as well. Um, blue crabs are actually able to be caught year round in Florida. There are uh, sort of a rolling one to two week closure that moves its way around the state every other year. Um, but the only reason there's a closure on that is so that they can find derelict traps and remove derelict traps. And with Florida regulations, at least, any of these that are caught in a trap, the traps actually have panels in them that rot out over a certain amount of time. So if somebody runs over a, a float line for a trap and has to cut it or whatever else, if a trap gets lost in a storm, it doesn't keep catching fish indefinitely within a fairly short amount of time, the panel rots out of the side of it, and then things can come and go. Let's see, the other one that's interesting is the stone crab claws, um, and the reason is it's the only one of them where we don't harvest the whole animal. Uh, with the stone crab claws, the claw has to be over a certain size, it has to be taken in a very specific way, um, but the animal is returned and the survival rate's actually pretty high as long as the claws is removed properly. And then over so many years, they'll actually regrow the claw. So they can be harvested mul potentially multiple times off the same animal even. Although you would hope after a couple times it would figure out not to go into the trap. <laughs> the other part of this too is that in addition to wild caught seafood, there's also farmed seafood in Florida. Um, channel catfish and tilapia are farmed in fish farms, which this is a fish farm up here, not that they're all set up this way. Um, but farmed fish can be okay. The big thing is when you're looking at American versus imported farmed fish, the American farmed fish have much higher regulations. The quality is much better. The handling regulations are much better um, as opposed to things that are imported where it can sometimes be tenuous at best. Uh, the clams and oysters are farmed typically in open water. Um, and they're doing research now on trying to farm spiny lobster. It's been attempted a few times and it just doesn't work out well. It's interesting because in nature, spiny lobsters are a social animal, unlike the northern lobsters with the big claws who don't like anybody around them. Um, the southern lobsters, if you ever go lobstering where you dive down and try and find them, you'll often find them clumped up three and four under a coral head or in a shipwreck somewhere. Um, so you would think they would do well in a farm, they've tried it and nobody's entirely sure why, whether it's a, a salinity or water pH or a temperature thing, um, but so far they've been very, very tricky to farm. The other thing that's on the horizon, and it's still way out there, um, but it's trying to farm open water fish and some of the smaller tuna species are the, the premium choice for that. And they've already had success in the North Sea um, off of Scotland with big open water pens. Basically, you can kind of picture a giant ball made out of chain link fence and you put it offshore with an automated feeder on the top of it. The advantage to a big open water offshore farming operation is that when you farm on land, like you have with the catfish or the tilapia, um, or if you farm in a contained bay, like they do with salmon down in um, the southernmost parts of South America, you have issues with handling the amount of waste that's produced and how that affects water quality and how that affects water pH and all sorts of other things. When you move that same operation into big, deep, open water, there's enough water flow, there's enough water volume involved that it's not an issue anymore. Um, and so it kind of shifts the viability of it. The other thing, of course, are things that are sort of exotic meats, um, some of which are not local uh, in the sense of a normally locally occurring species. Um, but these are all things that can be found in Florida. Alligator, of course, is farmed and it's local. 
Um, sturgeon for caviar is farmed, and there is actually a local species of sturgeon, although it's exceedingly rare, but I was just reading a report this morning that they're starting to see them coming back into the Suwannee River, um, which is where they were historically. So that's a really great thing. Uh, lionfish, which unfortunately we have, those are super invasive. Uh, there are different places trying to work to get it put on the menu. The big problem right now with lionfish is they won't generally take a hook and they won't go in a trap. At least we haven't figured out how to trap them yet, which means the only way to catch one is to send somebody down with a spear gun. And so it winds up being very, very expensive. Um, the last time I looked, I think lionfish was going for about the same price as black grouper. Um, so you're looking at somewhere between 18 and low 20s a pound. So it's very expensive. I have heard it's really good. I haven't had the opportunity to try it yet. Um, but it's an invasive, so it's one of those that the more we catch, the better, regardless of whether we eat them or not. Octopus is local, and it's out there. Actually, a couple years ago, the stone crab fishermen had real problems with the octopus getting into the stone crab pots before they could and taking care of the catch. Um, there's squid, although mostly further south and fairly small. And there's also freshwater eels in Florida, which are not everybody's cup of tea, but they are something that's eaten in some places. So now we get kind of into the, a couple of the big issues when you get into talking about seafood. One of the big ones is fresh versus frozen. And there's a really important distinction to make with freezing. And that's just sort of frozen, like if you took, caught a fish, took it home, put it in your freezer, and flash freezing. And the difference between the two is that flash freezing happens instantly or almost instantly. And if you look down at a sort of microscopic level, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense immediately, but that's what this picture is supposed to be down here. Um, that was done by the Bird's Eye Corporation when they were researching frozen vegetables back in the 50s. But basically, if you zoom all the way down and look at a single cell in whatever it is that you're freezing, if you take it and you put it in a home freezer and let it very slowly cool and very slowly freeze, all the water in it, of course, turns to ice. When that happens slowly, the ice crystals form slowly and they're very, very big and they'll burst the walls of that cell. And that's why if you take a piece of fish and take it home and freeze it, it's often tends to be a little mushy um, or a little softer when it comes out, not quite as um, vibrant in the flavor and all that kind of thing. It's because it freezes very slowly and so those cell walls get burst and all the things that were in the cells now kind of leak out a little bit and it's just not as good as it was. With flash freezing, they drop the temperature very quickly. It can be done with super chilled water. It can be done with um, nitrogen. There's multiple different ways to do it. But because that freeze goes from whatever temperature it's at to below zero so rapidly, the ice crystals don't get a chance to really form. And because the ice crystals don't really form, all the water still freezes. But because those crystals stay tiny, they don't burst the cell walls. And so they make a very, very minimal impact on the flavor. Um, they've done studies and have found generally things that are flash frozen um, compete very well with things that are relatively fresh. The other thing that comes into play, and it's kind of a grim thing to say, but with any kind of uh, fish, with any kind of animal protein, immediately after it's killed, all the muscles tense up and it takes a certain amount of time for those muscles to relax. And until they relax, the meat isn't as good, the flavor isn't as good. And so having a fish that, say, is caught, is put on ice on a boat for an hour or two or a couple hours, depending, and then is flash frozen to preserve it for longer into the year can produce a really good quality of meat. Um, so that's kind of the important thing there. The other part, like I say at the bottom, is seafood is, of course, out at sea. Um, traveling anywhere in a boat takes time, and flash freezing helps to lock in the flavor. The big place where we see flash freezing, especially um, right on the boat, is with a lot of the shrimp fleets. Um, a lot of the shrimp fleets flash freeze the shrimp on the boat for storage, and that's because if they're coming from Texas or Louisiana or Alabama, and they're going to the big, still really the big fishing grounds in the Gulf or all the way down by the Dry Tortugas west of Key West, that's not an overnight trip. Um, that's something where they're gonna be out for five or six or seven days, and being able to preserve the catch as it comes in allows them to fill their hold with what is functionally a fresh catch and bring it back and sell it. It also means that if they know there's three or four places they can sell it, because it's frozen and it can stay frozen for a little while before there's any effect, they can kind of choose which place they're gonna to sell to and get a better price sometimes. The other big seafood question, especially lately, 
um, is concerns about mercury levels in the seafood. And when I started researching this, it comes across kind of a few different interesting pieces of information. Um, the first thing is the whole deal with mercury has to do more with selenium than with mercury. Selenium is a chemical in your brain that helps your brain function, basically. It helps you think faster and think better. Mercury, if it's in your blood, your body gets rid of it by bonding selenium to it to get it out of your bloodstream. What this means is that if you have lots of mercury, it uses lots of your selenium, and that selenium then doesn't work for help to help with your brain function. So that's where the whole mercury thing comes in. But what this also means is that when you're looking at fish, you have to look at the selenium levels and the mercury levels, because most fish have a whole lot more selenium than they do mercury. And so when you eat them, yes, it has mercury in it, and it's still probably not a good idea to eat five pounds of it a day every day of the week, um, but it's much less of a concern than it immediately seems like. The exception, um, are the handful here, and it's sharks, tilefish, king mackerel, and swordfish all have high mercury to selenium levels. On the chart here, the blue is selenium, the red is mercury. So you can see, especially in the cases of the tuna down here at the bottom, there is way more selenium in them than there is mercury, and so they're really very safe to eat. Freshwater fish, on the other hand, are highly variable in their amounts of selenium, so there's not really a lot of study done on them because depending on what body of water they're living on, what species they are, it affects their selenium level, and so there's not sort of a, a base level to work from. The um, saltwater fish that are high in selenium are either high predator fish like the sharks and the king mackerel and the swordfish, or they're very, very long-lived fish um, like the tilefish are. And part of what's interesting about this is that most of the um, seafood amount you can eat recommendations based on mercury levels are from the FDA. But if you look at the recommendation levels from NOAA, they say it's a much higher level that you can eat that's safe. And when you look at it, what it comes down to is when the FDA did their studies on this, they used a study from northern England and Scotland um, and specifically included some people from the Faroe Islands which are in the extreme north of Scotland and the Faroe Islands where they live they're still allowed to eat whale. The problem is whale is a top marine predator and it's a warm-blooded animal so it doesn't have the high selenium so it's extremely high in mercury and very low in selenium. They had one person in the study who was from the Faroe Islands who had very high mercury levels because they were eating whale. If you take that one person out of the study they were using, everything else shifts back to really normal levels. NOAA, on the other hand, didn't use that study and incorporated a lot of studies from the Pacific and especially from Japan where people eat huge amounts of um, sea fish, especially tuna, and have no noticeable difference in mercury levels from a regular person. But again, when you look here, if you're not including whale and you're not including shark and some of the other things, if you're just eating tuna, um, you have huge amounts of selenium as opposed to mercury. That being said, I am not advising anybody to go out and eat five pounds of fish tonight, but uh, it's something to be mindful of and it's something you can absolutely go out and do your own research. All of the, the NOAA study and the FDA study, it's all available online if you want to go look on it and form your own opinions, but it's something that often isn't brought out when people are talking about seafood and it's kind of an important thing. Um, I know personally I'm allergic to shellfish, so I don't pay too much attention to shellfish, but when the whole mercury thing came out with saltwater fish, it kind of got me down because I really like eating fish. Um, but finding this out was a great thing, as long as I'm eating the right kinds of fish, I can now go out and eat what I want. Now, before I was talking about farming clams and oysters, and this is kind of a win-win thing. Um, oysters can filter up to six and a half gallons per hour, that's per oyster. Um, that's an ideal situation in a very large oyster, but the point remains, they're able to filter through a lot of water. Um, now, it doesn't mean that you have to worry about pollutants and things in the water. Florida actually is very, very restrictive about where um, bottomlands can be leased to farm oysters and clams. The water level in those areas is very carefully monitored for any possible contamination of really just about anything. Um, 
But what it means for areas like Sarasota Bay or Terracilla Bay or Tampa Bay, and there are um, oysters being farmed in Terracilla and South Tampa Bay area for sure, and is that the water clarity improves. And the reason that's really important in the big picture is that the clearer the water is, the more sunlight gets through it to the shallows, and that's where the seagrass beds are. And the seagrass beds and the coastal mangroves provide sort of the nursery environment for almost all of the fish species that we have in the Gulf. It includes the snapper and the grouper, it includes the mullet, all of those things. So the more seagrass beds we have, the better everything else is for it. And so having these um, farms out there in areas where the water quality is good, that the meat is edible, means that the water clarity or the, the clearness of the water improves, which then means you get the improved seagrass, you get more snapper, you get more grouper, you get more mullet, you get more pretty much everything, you even get more manatees. So it's a good thing all the way around, not just for those of us that eat seafood. Now with um, kind of getting into the, the tail end of this here and sort of the things to look for, one of the things that's really good about the state of Florida is that our Department of Agriculture, which the website's really easy to remember, it's freshfromflorida.com, um, does all sorts of things, but one of the big things they do is promote Florida seafood. They promote all sorts of agricultural things grown in Florida as well, so this sort of falls under their purview. But when you go to their website, you can kind of find your way to an area that has recipes for all sorts of different things, um, but also, you know, if you're not sure what to look for when you go out and look for a swordfish steak or go out and look for a big grouper filet, um, it'll kind of give you a description of it. These are sort of general sense of, you know, translucent meat. Um, you want it to be firm and not falling apart. You want it to smell nice and clean and like the ocean and not like bleach or like bait. Um, you know, it's, it's, most of it's pretty common sense, but it's really... It should look good if it doesn't look good unless it's frozen and it's defrosting, which can affect the clarity of the meat a little bit. Um, you know, if it doesn't look good and smell good, you should probably go somewhere else. Um, fortunately, I can tell you I've been to the, the places that sell seafood here in Cortez and it's always been good. I've been to a couple of the other places in Bradenton that sell seafood and I haven't yet found a place that wasn't selling really good stuff. The other part of it is then frozen fish. I was talking before about the flash freezing process and that it's mostly done to shrimp, but it's done to fish as well. Um, especially fish that aren't local fish are typically flash frozen at a fish house wherever they're caught and then shipped frozen and then thawed out sort of a few pieces at a time to sell in the store. Um, so one of the big things that comes with that is if you're going somewhere and you wanna buy fish for say later in the week or maybe even next week, a lot of times you can ask them, hey, do you have some flounder still or some swordfish that's still frozen? I want to get it now, but I want to eat it later. If you take it home frozen, as long as that stays frozen, it can go in your freezer and it can stay there for a little while without any loss. Um, you just have to defrost it according to really sort of standard defrosting meat processes, um, which is again, all pretty common sense of, you know, you don't just leave it out on the counter. You don't put it in a bowl and then use the bowl for other things without washing it. Um, but it's a good thing to kind of keep in mind, uh, especially if you don't live next to Cortez or work in Cortez, like some of us are fortunate to. The other thing is going through the Department of Agriculture website, going through the Florida Wildlife um, Commission, going through the fisheries and looking at all of them and seeing where the overlaps are. These are what sort of come up as the most sustainable for wild caught Florida seafood. Um, the stone crab is probably the most sustainable because they don't kill the stone crab. Um, they just take one or two of the claws off, generally just one, but sometimes they do take two. They've actually done studies, if they take both claws off the stone crab, it goes from a predatory feeding mode to a scavenger feeding mode and only comes out at night until one of the claws gets big enough that it can protect itself. Um, so they're actually even adapted naturally to dealing with that kind of a situation if they have to. Mahi-mahi are really great because they're very fast growing fish. Um, and what that means from a fisheries standpoint, from a management standpoint, is that they replace each other very, very quickly. So we're able to catch a lot of mahi-mahi and serve a lot of mahi-mahi. Um, and it's really a pretty good fish. Mullet's fantastic. Um, well, I think mullet's fantastic. <laughs> a lot of people think mullet's fantastic. It is a very oily fish. It is a very fishy fish. 
um, but it's very common to have it smoked or fried and it's incredibly high in omega-3 acids. So if you're eating fish for your health, mullet is a great one to track down. Um, I promise you, if you have it smoked enough, you're gonna like it. Uh, if not, just put more hot sauce on it until you can't tell the difference. But I really like it. Um, pompano is a rare one to see because it doesn't generally school. And the, so fishing for it is more just by a fisherman being in the right place at the right time. Um, but if you get a chance to get pompano, although it's often very expensive, it's a fantastic fish. Um, tuna includes all the tuna species. Some of the tuna species are less sustainable than others but generally the ones that are caught in Florida waters. Um, so if you go to the, the seafood market and you say, you know, was this landed in Florida? Odds are it's one of the species that is very sustainable. The couple species that are less sustainable are very rarely caught in Florida waters. And that's one of the other things that comes in as well is when you look at some of the um, conservation groups that put out sustainability studies, they look at the big picture. So they might look at say, long lining techniques around the world that kind of bounce back on a topic we talked about last month. Um, and in a lot of places, long lining techniques are really pretty atrocious and they have really huge amounts of bycatch, which is the things that you don't want to get caught anyways. At least in Florida waters and in um, United States managed waters, the regulations on those are much more strict and the bycatch is very, very small. Um, the same thing goes for some of the net fishing and some of the other things as well. So it's a case of, in the broad sense, it might not be a sustainable species, but according to really all of the government agencies that are involved in the fishery down here, these are all species that you can feel pretty good about eating. And then, um, as I said before, the statements of sustainability are based on the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, Florida Department of Agriculture, and the Gulf and South Atlantic Fisheries Foundation. That's the one that I can never remember the last part for. Um, and then the safety of mercury levels in fish are based on research by um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and some of their affiliates from around the world. Um, one of those affiliates does include a seafood production company or a seafood company, um, but it's all really well balanced and justified when you kind of hunt it down and look through it. And then the last slide here, um, of course, is Freshfromflorida.com is the Florida Department of Agriculture website. And then I've got, uh, at least currently where they are, the two big fish markets in Cortez. Cortez Bait and Seafood is just right down 119th Street here. And uh, Starfish Company is over by the Starfish Restaurant next to AP Bell. If you kind of go out of our parking lot more or less straight and take the f left at the first stop sign, it's 123rd something, because they've got 123rd Street and I think Court and then Drive all in a row there. But any of them will get you down to the right area. You'll be able to find it because it'll be where all the cars are parked. Um, but any of those locations are great for seafood. And again, our website is floridamaritimemuseum.org. But I'd say if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to do my best to answer them. Like I said, I don't eat shellfish, so I can't tell you much about those, but I'll tell you everything I know. Yes? Sturgeon, I, I uh, read it and heard it at the uh, malt, malt. Mm -hmm. they are now producing the sturgeon, the caviar. Okay, yeah, if anybody didn't hear that, um, I, I've heard that as well, so thank you for reminding me that Moat is now starting to farm raise um, sturgeon for caviar as well. Um, and in that same vein as caviar uh, is Botarga, which is mullet roe that's processed and salted under a very specific process. Um, traditionally, it's from Sicily and, and those areas in Italy, um, but there is a local company that produces batarga and uses it on, uh, it's used by gourmet cooks and it's used on salads and things. Um, and it's, again, if you like a fishy flavor, it's a really great little addition to something. You put a very small amount into whatever you're cooking, um, but it's quite good. Yes? <laughs> so the first question is, how do they flash freeze fish on boats? Um, and the answer is basically the same way they would do it anywhere else. But generally, if a boat's flash freezing fish, it's going to be a pretty large boat. The facilities to do that aren't something that it, it's not going to fit on somebody's Carolina skiff. It's going to take a big, probably 45 to 50 plus foot boat for it to even be an option. Um, that's part of the reason the shrimp boats get so big is that to make room for the freezers and make room for all the extra equipment below decks, 
so they can flash freeze. Um, the second question was, if oysters and clams are filter feeders, are they still good to eat? Um, as somebody who eats liver on occasion, which is the same function, uh, I would say yes, although I don't eat them. Um, but that's because of the iodine in them, not because they're um, filter feeders. I think it's fine to eat them, at least again in, in Florida, any of them that are coming out of Florida are coming out of areas that have very strict regulations on the water quality and the pollutants that can be in the water all have to be at, frankly, almost ridiculously low levels um, in order to be able to sell them within the state. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Is Wahoo very plentiful here? Um, I don't know. I know if you get over on the Atlantic, especially further south, it's pretty plentiful. I don't know how it is in the Gulf offhand now. Yes? Years ago, I toured the prison, and they were farm-raising fish. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're still doing it. Yeah, it's the question was years ago, the prison, or the, was it the county jail? Yeah. Yeah, that was farm-raising fish. And as far as I know, they're still doing it. Yeah. Yes. When you showed about the shrimp that we have here, you showed that there was brown, white, and pink. We were watching a show on TV one time, and this was up in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. <laughs> um, the, the, the question was, uh, in North Carolina, the different colors of shrimp come in seasonally. Um, down here we have white, pink, um, royal red, rock shrimp. And I think those are the big ones for, for Florida. I think we have brown as well. Um, I know the pink shrimp are regional in that they're the, the big area for those, at least historically, was just north of the Dry Tortugas. Um, I don't know about the rest and whether they were seasonal or not. I'm sure for a lot of them there was probably seasons where they are better in certain areas or certain species just because of how most sort of organisms are, but I, I don't have a good answer on that. In St. Augustine, they'll, I mean, they'll trawl off of, off of the Atlantic coast, but a lot of them are coming all the way down to um, the Tortugas by the end of their trip and, and back up. Um, and so depending on where they are, I think determines what they catch. Because I know the different species of shrimp, some of them live at different depths. I know the, the royal reds, for example, live much deeper. Okay. Um, okay. So it's also where you're caught and season I think so, yeah. 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 Yes? The farm raised, let's say, a fish of the shrimp. Mm -hmm. what, what do they feed? What are the farm-raised fish and, and shrimp and things fed? Um, it depends where they are. Generally, it's in, in the Americas, it tends to be something that's actually a um, feed that's for farm-raised fish. The only place they start, or sort of the only part of that where it starts to get a little, I don't know what quite the right word is, but some places do add some dye to it, um, which affects the color of the meat. Mostly that's with salmon farming, um, so you don't see too much of it in North America, but it does happen in some places. Um, but the feeds are, are generally protein-based, animal protein-based um, feeds for the fish. And so it's designed for fish, but it's a protein-based. In some cases it's a fish meal base. In some cases it's um, livestock protein or whatever else. Uh, when they process livestock for food, there's lots of bits of meat and things that we won't eat that's still good protein that can go into animal feed. But that's pretty common for most animal feeds, whether it be fish or chicken or um, whatever that's an animal that needs protein as part of its diet. Yes? How long will like, your regular stone crab live? So how many times can it have its That's a good question. Um, off the top of my head, I want to say that what I'm, it's been a while since I did the research on that. I want to say like six or seven years. Um, if you look at a stone crab claw on the inside of it near the joint, um, if it's wrinkly like a fingerprint, that's a regrown claw. And if it's smooth, that's an original claw. I do remember that part. It takes them, I want to say about six months to start regrowing the claw, but it takes a couple years before it's back to full size where it's a marketable size. Just like with the spiny lobster, there's a sort of a gauge that if it's too big to fit in the gauge, it's good. If it's 
fits in the gauge or is smaller, it's too small and you have to put it back. Okay, but like, there's this big club, but then you can also, sometimes you said you can take the other two, the other one too? The, if, if, if both are big enough, yeah, with a, a stone crab, if neither claw has been harvested, so they're both original, both claws are about the same size. Um, but some fishermen won't take both claws even if they're both good size because they want to make sure the crab has the best chance. So even though they can take both, it's unusual to take both. So then, so then like, if one kept on getting caught? Yeah. Potentially it could one have... One would come off one year and then the other one would come off the next year. Potentially, yeah. It'd be like, okay, uh, yeah. six years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. So, so I have been doing that. Yeah. And I noticed that no place is in farm raised. <laughs> every restaurant that you ask, it's always wild caught. And then I talked to somebody in the restaurant business, and they said nobody will tell you if it's farm raised. So. Yeah. From from the restaurant side of things, sometimes it can be really tricky. Um, because, because of the length of the supply chain. If you go to a fish market, they can tell you for sure whether it's wild caught or farm raised. The other thing that's kind of important to ask or, or a good way to phrase it when you ask for a lot of the Florida seafood, especially for shrimp, because um, you can't really ask for these local shrimp because if they're caught off the keys, they're not local shrimp. What you want to ask is are they Florida shrimp or are they Florida landed shrimp? Um, and that'll get you the, the answer you're looking for as to whether they're it something. It doesn't help with salmon, no. No, it doesn't. Um, yeah, there's, there's not a, a good way to, to ask. Now, in Florida, it's, it's tricky because Florida actually has really strong regulations that seafood must be what you say it is. Um, the problem is that when you get all the way down to sort of the waiter level of asking that question, a lot of times they don't know or they they only know what they're told and so it becomes tricky as to exactly who's bending the truth on it um, but florida actually very strictly enforces um, and they actually have people that that's their job is to track down people that are selling mislabeled seafood um, and i think uf has some students working on they call it a pen i'm sure it's bigger than a pen um, that will actually be able to dna test uh, a piece of uncooked fish and tell you what species it is um, and I think they're trying to get it to the point where it can tell you what kind of grouper it is because that's been one of the big things with grouper is people selling things that aren't grouper as grouper and especially selling things that aren't black grouper as black grouper yeah. since there's usually a four or five dollar difference between black grouper and um, typically it's red grouper but it can be a lot of other things when it's just labeled as grouper. Uh, what's the difference? I mean, how that, that's <laughs> that, that um, explained to me that floater, floater. Okay, so that's a good question with a, what's a floater when you're talking about stone crab claws? So that's one of the other things that's really interesting with stone crab. With shrimp, they're typically frozen when they get right on the boat. Stone crab by Florida leg legislation has to either be cooked on the boat or as soon as it gets to the dock. The reason is the longer that crab is detached from the claw, or the longer the claw is detached from the crab without being cooked, the more the meat inside shrinks. If the meat inside shrinks enough, it becomes what's called a floater. From what I've been told, because again, I don't eat it, so I can't vouch for it, unfortunately, there's no difference in flavor, or there's no noticeable difference in flavor. And the floaters are generally less expensive because they're less desirable to the restaurants because you feel like you're getting less meat for the size of the claw. Um, but there's not really a big difference, and that's really the only difference in it is that it just went a little bit longer before it was cooked, and it doesn't affect the quality of the meat or anything else. When yes. The yeah, the the stone crab boats aren't out very long. Most of the stone crab pots are. I mean, you'll see when stone crab season comes around, you'll see all the buoys pop up here in the bay and just off the beach. As the weather changes, they'll shift them into deeper water. Um, but they're, they're day boats. They're not out for, for more than a day at a time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's, that would be pretty quick. Yeah, it's a, it's a quick turnaround. Are yes. Are commercial fishing boats around here equipped with a flash freezing? I, I don't know. Um, my guess would be most of them probably are not. 
um, just because the, the duration that they're going, most of the boats are going out for and the distance most of them are traveling is not that far. Um, I know one of the larger boats that's usually at Cortez Bait and Seafood is just a bait boat, so they're not gonna flash freeze anyways because with bait it doesn't matter. Um, but I honestly don't know the answer to that. That would be a question to ask down at, probably at Starfish. Um, at the fish market there, they could probably tell you. So if you buy, buy a fish, or you catch a fish yourself, it's fresh that day. Yeah. Um, what's the recommendations if you can't eat it immediately? Ah. <laughs> yeah, generally with um, the Florida Department of Agriculture says that if, you're, if you've caught it yourself to eat it within they say three to five days, and I would say probably three to four days um, of when you've, when you've caught it, um, just because it doesn't, fish doesn't keep well, just refrigerated. Um, you can freeze it at home, but it's not going to freeze well, and that's just because it's that slow freezing process that's gonna burst a lot of the cell walls as opposed to flash freezing. Um, so the, the best thing really is to not catch more than you can eat in the next couple days, or have a lot of friends that like eating fish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Do they sell smoked mullet down here? Um, I know uh, Cortez Bait and Seafood typically has smoked mullet dip, and they often have smoked mullet. They smoke it themselves. Um, so they may or may not have it right now, depending on the last time they ran the smoker. But depending on when that was, they do carry it. They just don't always have it. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for coming out. And we do have that exhibit opening in the summer, um, if you're going to be here. If not, have a great summer, and we will see you when you come back.